a Zoom-like product um, on, on, uh, on the screen. Some, some people will be live. So I think we got one Zoom today, the rest of will be live. Um, we are gonna be recording this uh, for future use. So that's what this whole team is all around here for. Uh, so be, be cognizant of that. If, if on the Zoom presentation you have a question, there's a microphone right here with a pink, pink tag on it. Walk up to that microphone to ask the question. Please do not touch it. Do not touch the microphone. It's just walk up about as distant as I am from here and, and ask your question so that the people that are on Zoom can hear your question. That'll be this afternoon. Now we'll cover that again. So anyway, we're recording this, so be, be cognizant of the fact we're recording it. So if you get up and get down or, or whatever, don't block the, the, uh, the cameras. There's one here, there's one back there, and I think we have a third one somewhere. Or is it just the two, Mr. Abadar? It's just the two, this one here and that one back there, okay. Afternoon, now we'll cover that again. Okay, so, so we're recording this, so be eight cognizant of the fact we're recording it. So if you get up and get down or, or whatever, don't block the I would say I, the, I recognize that voice. Cameras. There's one here. Uh, Going back there, and I think we have a third. So one we're we're ready. Just the two. Okay, so um, just welcome. The two, this one um, that let's begin with a, a short we'll prayer, and then we'll, we'll get started okay, with that. Uh, so we're uh, recording this. So okay. be, be gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you today, or, thankful or whatever, that we're able to come here yeah, and, uh, and gather together here. and uh, serve you. We pray for your blessings on this event. Uh, come here and be with us. In your name, we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. This is Chapman Soldier. Can you see and hear me? Yes, yes sir. sir. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm assuming we're live here. Sorry for the technical difficulties, and thank you for making this happen with all of the uh, challenges that we have in this current COVID environment and, uh, and the uh, limitations of technology. I want to welcome and thank you for joining us today for this inaugural Executive Leader Science of Spirituality course. Uh, this has uh, been a long time in coming. Um, but I'm deeply appreciative of the initiatives group uh, partnering with uh, cutting edge scientists from the field of human behavior and spirituality to develop and present this course for all of us. Uh, this course is designed to inform Army senior leaders on scientific research regarding human spirituality and religious practice and their potential impact, as it were, on preventing suicide, sexual assault, and maximizing human potential and performance. The, the application step 
is that the course is intended to help um, our Army senior leaders understand the connections between spirituality, religion, and mental <clears throat> behavioral health fields in order to enhance the Army support to soldiers in adult development, fitness, readiness, decision making, and overall mental health and well being and resilience. The Pew Research reminds us that Americans are religious. Eight out of 10 Americans believe that religion is important. Seven out of 10 Americans attend religious services on a weekly or more frequent basis. Since such a large number of Americans actively practice religion and spirituality, we must engage what that would mean for us in the Army, especially because research reveals the protective nature of religion and spirituality. Young adults and adolescents with an active personal religious faith or spirituality are protected against widespread forms of suffering that life can induce. Among other things, the protection leads to fewer suicide attempts, more negative attitudes towards suicide, which is very important. 60% shielding against major depression and 70% defense against substance dependence. I want to introduce to you today our colleague and friend, Dr. Lisa Miller. Dr. Miller is a professor of psychology and education at Columbia University Teachers College, and she is the founder of the Spirituality Mind Body Institute, the first Ivy League graduate program in spirituality and psychology. Dr. Miller's Innovative research has focused on identifying the quantifiable effects of spirituality on health, resilience, well-being, thriving, and the benefits of what we would call a sacred life, living it to its fullest. Lisa is a true friend to our Army and our Chaplain Corps, and I ask that uh, you give her your undivided attention over the course of these next few days. I want to thank uh, her personally for for collegiality and support of us uh, over time as we have sent uh, groups of our people in our leader development course um, to Columbia and to New York City to other venues um, and that the effects of that relationship um, over time has impacted our people um, and has led to uh, to us gathering here today and over the next few days uh, to look at these very, very critical issues. This is a lane that as the chaplaincy, we must own. And in order for us to own this, uh, we must uh, be knowledgeable and competent uh, regarding all of the things that impact uh, the well-being of those that we're called to care for. It's our sacred mission and calling. So I'm thankful uh, here for the partnership uh, with our uh, cutting edge leading experts that you're going to be exposed to over the next few days. Um, I'm excited for the opportunity for all of us. Um, I regret that I will not be able to, due to my schedule, to be able to be there in person, but I look forward to seeing uh, you tomorrow uh, and having a discussion with you. Again, I just thank Dr. Miller for uh, her support of us. Uh, and I, uh, I know that you're going to be very blessed um, and intellectually stimulated and challenged uh, by what you're going to see and hear uh, over the next few days and as you engage each other on this topic. Again, I want to thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules uh, to, to attend. Uh, and uh, I know it's not easy with the travel restrictions and other things, so I deeply appreciate it. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to the team and to Dr. Lisa Miller. Uh, again, I, I pray that uh, you will uh, be uh, uh, changed, as it were, um, over what you're going to see and hear, um, and mo and move to action, uh, which is what uh, we ultimately want this to do, is to move us to a place of uh, uh, owning the white space of the, the religious and spiritual dimension as it relates to the, the care of our soldiers, families, and civilians. So may the good Lord bless you all um, and keep you, and I look forward to seeing you very soon. Uh, take care. For God and country, live the call. Good morning. 
this is a blessing to be here. This meeting happened in the realm of miracles, and I want to thank Chaplain Soldrum, Chaplain McGraw, Chaplain Marcy, Chaplain Fisher, Chaplain James, Chaplain Wesley, and every one of you here today. This is the culmination of 18 months, maybe two years, of intensive discussion, planning, and finding how our two callings really do intertwine. So I come here with enormous gratitude um, and appreciation. Um, I'm in awe of your service. I'm humbled to be here. Chaplain McGraw taught me that in introducing myself, it was helpful to always start not only with my professional bio. I've been a professor at Columbia for 20 years. I'm a clinical scientist, um, but also with a word about my personal faith life. I am a Jewish person. I'm a deeply spiritual person. I've raised my children to be deeply spiritual people, and I had a dream as a child, which was someday I could visit inside all different houses of worship. So this is part of that dream. Um, I came to clinical science in the late 90s, at which time there wasn't a single thread of research on spiritual or religious life as it may help recovery, as it may help prevention around some of the most pressing mental health concerns at that time. In the past 20 years, um, my lab, as well as fellow labs around the country, have developed now hundreds, close to thousands, of peer review articles, which in aggregate I'll share with you today. Um, excuse me one minute. Uh, maybe if I point it over there. Well. May I trouble someone for some help? And in the meantime, oh, it is, OK. Um, I'd like you to know, first and foremost, that whereas personal spirituality and religion are often used synonymously ah, within our culture, very often scientists in this field are asked, how do you define spirituality? And it is not within the wheelhouse of science to claim a definition of spirituality. That is not our expertise. But what we can do is use the lens of science to identify threads within spiritual and religious life that have a profound impact on all other dimensions of our life. And for instance, we can find that there are biological correlates of the capacity for spiritual life. We can say that someone who lives a devout life is less likely to face depression or addiction. We can make claims about the capacity for perception and decision making and fitness. We can look at the outcomes of spiritual life. And within spiritual life, we can identify those threads which are most closely associated with those outcomes. So our claims are not spiritual claims. They're claims about the impact of lived spiritual life on all other lines of human endeavor. In the United States, as many of you know, if I might invite you to envision an overlapping Venn diagram, here we have religion and here we have spirituality. About two thirds of people in our country are in the middle. They say my deep spiritual life is fulfilled through my faith tradition, through the prayers, the texts, my community. About 30% of millennials and fewer with each younger, with each older generation say I am spiritual but I am not religious. Spirituality for me is found in nature, in my family, through art. And a small number of people will say, I am religious, but I don't know what you mean by that spirituality thing. So all told, religion is a rich embrace of spiritual life. They often go hand in hand, but it is not always the case. There are some people, and I'm sure you've seen many amongst your soldiers who say, I am spiritual, but I am not religious. As I present this science, my hope is that you can see where the tremendous impact of religion shapes and forms spirituality, and where when you see spiritual but not religious soldiers, you have inroads for action. Okay. Excuse me. Um, all told, may I trouble someone to help me with this? All told, the spiritual literature, if you will, creates a blueprint. A blueprint for, as Chaplain Soljum said, action. It indicates points of intervention, points of prevention, points of treatment, and ways in which the chaplain, and uniquely the chaplain, can make a contribution that's not otherwise offered through mainstream behavioral health. The impact of a strong spiritual core, if you will, are broad and pervasive. Mental health prevention and recovery, decision and fitness, 
the, at this point over the aggregate of the literature, it is not surprising that the reach is so broad and pervasive because the core is so central to all other lines of perception, action, and motivation. I'll just wave my hand. Have a, do, I, do I work here? Ah, good, fabulous, thank you. I always start with this. This is a brain represented in the broad and pervasive regions in red that has benefited from a decade of spiritual practice. The broad and pervasive regions in red are regions of cortical thickness. The cortex is processing power. And in particular, these regions are regions of perception, reflection, and orientation. The brain, as you know, is my, is my lens into life. I could live in the same house with the same spouse and the same kids and the same job, and the whole thing looks entirely different because of the lens through which I work. In fact, this room looks entirely different because of the spiritual lens through which you look. Right? So to say that the brain has augmented power in regions of perception, reflection, and orientation is to say that I walk through life, I know myself, I know one another, and I know and reflect upon the nature of life itself entirely differently with far more capacity if I've sustained a spiritual practice. Now, before we dive into the broad view of this blueprint of science, suffice it to say that those regions in red of strength, if you will, of processing power associated with spiritual life with 85% overlap show not thickening, not cortical thickness, but rad rather cortical thinness in people with recurrent depression. What relevance has the chaplaincy to mental health and recovery? This is evidence published in JAMA Psychiatry in 2014 that sustaining spiritual life through religious support, through convening, through relational spirituality is associated with neuroprotective benefits against recurrent depression. And to add yet one more point, the effect was most robust in people who were most at risk. So those people who for environmental and genetic reasons were most likely to have severe recurrent lifetime depression were those people who saw the most robust synaptogenesis, the most impact of a thick cortex due to spiritual life. So right down to our brains, right down to the physiology of our brains, the impact of the chaplaincy cannot be replaced by mainstream current day behavioral health. And there's nothing else in society as I know it that provides that type of spiritual support and cultivation. Okay? So that is our front door and let us start. In aggregate, what is the blueprint of science from which we might identify calls to action? Well, you have a gift <laughs> in front of you. And, and, and the reason I put that book into the mix today is because there's references in the back and a story that is an aggregate of the science on the developmental path of spirituality across the lifespan. It is essential in childhood, adolescence, emerging adulthood, middle adulthood, and as elders to know that there is, just as there's a path of moral development and physical development, so too there is a path of spiritual development. And why is that? First finding, twin studies, which are the gold standard of how we discern whether any trait is innate or socialized, show that there is indeed a heritable contribution to our capacity for spiritual life. Just as we are naturally physical, moral, and social beings, emotional and intellectual, cognitive beings, so too we are innately spiritual beings. What is the size of that environmental versus genetic contribution? Well, Temperament is about half and half. Our temperament, whether we're hot-headed or laid back, whether we're open to experience or uptight, that is about half heritable, half socialized. The capacity through which we experience the transcendent, the sacred, not as a belief, but as a dynamic, felt, lived presence. The capacity for spiritual perception is one-third heritable, two-thirds socialized. Which means that in addition to being innately spiritual beings, two-thirds socialized, we have had in our path enormous impact from those around us, our parents, our faith community, our mentors and guides. Let's pause right now, where's the chaplain? Two-thirds socialized. 
you exert enormous formation on 18 through 25 year olds, profound formation. How do we know that? A longitudinal twin study shows us that going through puberty, not just age, but biological puberty, there's a 50% increase in the heritable contribution to our capacity for spiritual life. There's a surge, a biological clock, if you will, from the inside out. I'm sure you've seen it. I wonder, what is my purpose? What is the purpose? Does God really exist? I mean, my parents always said God exists, but does God exist? A questioning, a hunger to know. This can be answered through a deepening of faith. This can be answered through a driving questioning period. But left willy-nilly, this also can unravel. And this can be a time of enormous depression, of existential emptiness, of acting out as the tricky backdoor of addiction. Right? So in this period, the surge, which you see perhaps in your soldiers, no one can take your place. There is no one else who will meet this hunger, the two-thirds formative impact of environment on the formation of the spiritual core. This is known, of course, in our world faith traditions, bar and bat mitzvah, the Anipi confirmation. If the spiritual core is supported, we have two decades of science that says there is nothing as <clears throat> profoundly protective <clears throat> against the most prevalent forms of suffering in our country, depression, anxiety, addiction. Using a nationally representative sample, we looked at adolescents who said, yes, I turned to God for guidance in times of difficulty versus those who had no idea what I was talking about. And those who are a standard deviation above as compared to below a mean in the tendency to say, when I have a tough decision to make, I ask, what really does God want me to do? Again, not a belief, a lived, known, dynamic, perceived relationship. Right? Are 80% less likely to become addicted using diagnostic standards, this state of the field, right off the shelf, gold standard of diagnosis. 60% less likely to have major depressive disorder. Every teen will get depressed, but the downward spiral is far less likely when there is a spiritual response to suffering. Ken Kendler and his colleagues found that with each depressive episode, I'm more likely to get depressed the next time. Why? I develop a depressogenic way of thinking, living under the rain cloud. I think I am such a loser, bad things happen to me, I am unworthy. But if I instead can develop a spiritual response to terrible disappointment, my failures, I can augment, almost by way of analogy, build a muscle. Right? And that is the process through which the red brain is formed. Right? It's not by joyfully skipping through the field every day. It's through a response to suffering and disappointment very often that the strength of my spiritual understanding is deepened. It can, of course, you know well, enjoy and illumination be built. But in response to depression, a spiritual response builds a pathway of spiritual awareness. And finally, risk-taking in girls' unwanted um, relations and in boys very often driving fast, jumping off high places, this too shows an enormous impact. These were all published in top peer review journals, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, Journal of Adolescent Health. These are simply facts. So what does that mean for where we are now? Um, as Chaplain Soljim said, we benefit from being a religious country. We benefit greatly from our understanding of natural rights. But it is simply a, a challenge we face that you can, as you know well, see there's a decline of religious identity in our country, a decline in identification of knowledge of being raised by a parent or a grandparent who taught me to pray, who sat by my side when I was very disappointed or something horrible had happened and prayed by my side. There's a loss of whether I go to church, synagogue, mosque, wherever I go, it's far less likely now. And with that, hand in hand, has been this. In parallel, elevated rates even in the past five, 10 years of depression. And when we look at them head to head, do they in fact go hand in hand? Indeed they do. And in communities where there are the lowest rates of religious observance, we see elevated rates of depression and addiction. So we can look epidemiologically, just as when we fly in an airplane over cities, you, know, you can see where the clusters are. And the clusters of suffering 
are particularly accentuated where religion is least present. So these are the drowning cultural waves. And if I come to you as an 18 or 25 year old, you know where I've come from. And we'll in the next talk talk about development some more. But it is the foundation from which we're now gonna focus in this segment on what the chaplain can do based on the blueprint of science, what are points of information, in intervention and opportunity, particularly around two very pressing challenges, suicide and trauma. Okay. So as a rubric through which we might view this lens, I'm sure many of you have seen this before, I wanna highlight the difference between primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. Okay. So if I have a 1,000 18 through 25 year olds before me, whether there are a thousand new soldiers or a thousand people in my, any, in a football stadium, right? And I wanna help every single one of them should someday they have a challenge, right? Build your ark before it rains. If I wanna get ahead of it all, then I would give every single one of the thousand young people in the football stadium something that helpful, I know will help them down the road, that is primary prevention. You walked in the door the moment I saw you, primary, I give you something that I know down the road will help you. I know you have a chance in three, or a 50% chance of facing something very challenging. Put this in your bag, carry this in your inner heart, you will need this. Primary prevention. Secondary prevention is when I see people who've already started to slide. Someone who screams positive for suicidal ideation before they make an attempt. Someone who screams positive for depression before they become withdrawn. Right? Early sign. And I know, ooh, okay, it's no longer everyone in the football stadium. I know that these 20% are really starting to slide. Let's give them something now. And finally, tertiary prevention is when someone has already had a crisis. Someone has made an attempt at suicide and lived. Someone is deeply depressed, and I need to help them recover, gain back not only their capacity, but actually, given that this is the chaplaincy, use this moment for a better life, right? Okay, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Let's start with suicide. This is the most comprehensive study to date. It was done a few years ago by very, very beautiful meta-analysis by Wu. And what you can see is that in over 2,000 cases of tragically completed suicides matched by over 5,000 cases of controls, there was an enormous impact of religious life. I am 62% less likely to have completed suicide if I have a practicing faith tradition. And if I practice that with others, I'm 82% less likely to have completed suicide. This is a meta-analysis. It's a study of studies. These are the studies on which it's based. So Wu and colleagues rounded up every study that met certain specifications for quality control, used as the item of analysis both the subject in each study and the studies, and this is the finding. It's a very strong case. There's nothing as profoundly protective. There's nothing that decreases the risk for a completed suicide at all, in all the literature, clinical or social sciences, as a strong religious life, and it's stronger if it's shared, okay? So this is the most important finding in science when it comes to confronting our current epidemic in suicide, right? Now, tertiary prevention, right? These people, well, these people are completed cases, but the, if you have someone who made an attempt, you can really wonder, first and foremost, if there's not a religious and spiritual crisis or a lack of capacity thereof, right? And it's an extraordinary opportunity, tertiary prevention, to prevent against a recurrent attempt, to build more above and beyond where they've ever been before, build capacity renewal, but it is certainly, at very least, an attempt to prevent recurrence and a, second, and, and a recurrent attempt. Okay, let's step back to secondary prevention. Ideation, 
about a third of people with suicidal ideation if you passed around a screen or pulled everyone aside in an entire dining room and figured out who, who had had recent suicidal ideation. About a third of those people within two years will make an attempt. That's a very high rate. What are the risk factors? The social risk factors will not be surprising to you, but that's also, for your consideration, a point of identification for secondary prevention. Bullying, including cyberbullying, history of abuse or recent abuse, point clusters, right? I'm sure you've noticed that sometimes suicides are one here, one there, very often it's three here, five here. Point clusters. And isolation, loneliness, and social exclusion. Okay, so how might this be beneficial? Well, if you know that I have ideation, if you know that I've been bullied, you know I'm at increased relative risk for a suicide attempt. And it's a point for secondary prevention from the chaplain. Why the chaplain? Because there's a 50% decrease in risk for ideation associated with spiritual life. And that holds up cross-nationally. We found that in the US, we found that in India, we found that in China, it's, it's everywhere with places with or without religious expression of, and freedom. It is simply the case the spiritual core is profoundly protective. And what are some of the cognitive and um, affective, emotional signs? What are some of the risk factors there? Impulsivity, I'm sure you've seen this. Inflexibility, rigidity. I can't let go of my narrative. Rumination. Very interesting, affectively, it is negative affect, but it's also the lack of positive affect, the inability to also have joy. Right? These are all signs, and again, why the chaplain? Well, actually, no one can take your place because there is nothing as profoundly protective against an attempt as a strengthening of the spiritual core. Long term, I know you work with families, children of soldiers. The intergenerational transmission of pathology in general is very strong, and that includes suicide. There's evidence that between, if my parent takes his or her life, I'm three to five times more likely to make an attempt in my life. Why? Part heritable, part environmental. I've seen that to be the solution to suffering. It's an indelible memory, of course. Why else? Because I've probably grown up with impulsivity and aggression and taking the messages along the way and because I am wired to be at risk. It's all in. And still, biology is not destiny because the impact of religious and spiritual life is sea changing. It is absolutely sea changing. 50% decrease in suicidality was found in offspring of recurrent depressives who had themselves Many of them made suicide attempts. That was published in JAMA Psychiatry just a couple years ago. Okay, so these are not opinions. This is science. Every article you know goes through layers of peer review, and you might imagine when it concerns spirituality, religion, it goes through even another layer of peer review. And what I have found is that the best scientists are incredibly systematic, unbiased, and these articles have gotten into the best journals in our country because the evidence is clear and strong. And the good scientists follow the evidence, and the good scientists are also curious. OK, so David Brooks wrote a bit about that book. And I thought his point was important, which is if we have science that says this can ameliorate suffering, we have a major unraveling in the developmental spiritual path of our children then can't we find a way to, in a way that's inclusive and constitutional, put spiritual and religious voice back into the public square, back into our publicly funded ways of healing and helping people? The scientific argument, of course, is that it is not my religion or yours that this science to shows to be most beneficial, but rather that we are innately spiritual beings. There is nothing as profoundly protective and curative against the most prevalent forms of mental illness, and to not support the spiritual core is a form of iatrogenic harm. When I go to the hospital and I have a bruise and I walk away with the measles, I've gotten worse in the hospital. To not support the spiritual core is to allow for the unraveling. So we know that this is the best thing we have. If it were a pill, everyone would line up outside the CVS around the block. 
right? So the science says this is an action point, and it's an action point with very clear and specific points of intervention. Let's talk now about trauma. As many of you probably have seen, very often suffering and symptoms of trauma actually go hand in hand with symptoms of post-traumatic growth. And in fact, the best article done was done on about 3,000 vets by Psy, T-S-A-I. There is an inverted U-shaped curve showing the relationship between symptoms of trauma and symptoms of growth. As I move along the bottom x-axis, excuse me, as I move along the bottom x-axis, there is increased level of symptomology. Right? And as I move up the y-axis, there's increased level of growth. And what you can see, everyone here has faced trauma, right? is that the lion's share of people in the middle show meaningful growth to be spawned in and through trauma. Some people on the right are so flooded with trauma, as, as I'm sure you've seen, that they need more spiritual support, and some people on the left have not faced as much. But it is normative in the human process to metabolize trauma towards growth. That doesn't mean I'm not traumatized. It means that trauma and growth go hand in hand. Okay. So let's think of points of intervention. Tertiary, right in there, secondary, and primary. Close in there, tertiary and secondary. What is the process of growth and recovery as it might pertain to the chaplain? Science shows that these are the process variables in recovery that are germane to post-traumatic spiritual growth. The availability of the traumatic memory. Okay? So if I am drugged out of the availability of the traumatic memory, it may give me relief at the moment, but I will not have post-traumatic spiritual growth. Depending on how severe and how intolerable it is, it's worth considering, can that memory be engaged? The standard of the field for a long time in mainstream behavioral health has been uh, based on cognitive behavioral um, conceptualization, that if I repeat over and over the trauma, I weave together a narrative that is cohesive. If I repeat on the cognitive level, if I repeat over and over the trauma, this was first formed by Edna Foa, um, I de systematically desensitize the affect as if it were water dripping on me. Okay? Now, that may make me more inured to the trauma. That may take some of the sting out of the trauma, but that is not post-traumatic growth. That is not post-traumatic growth. And there is not a lot of data that says long-term there's deep and significant healing. It's certainly not the formation of the red brain. Now, I could do that treatment and also see you. Right? The availability of memories, flashbacks. Post-traumatic spiritual growth necessitates the ability to struggle and feel existential pain, moral guilt, spiritual injury. The availability that I bring to questioning and grappling with the deep existential pain avails our work to post-traumatic spiritual growth. And of course, it is accelerated by doing this work in community with others. Let's think of the capacity. I'm moving out here to primary prevention now. Okay. A thousand new soldiers before you, a football stadium. What capacity might you help build in me? How do we build our ark before it rains? Well, internal spiritual life. Somewhere long ago, someone may have prayed with me. Somewhere long ago, there's some thread of religion or spiritual life in my past. If you can help me identify that and strengthen that, it will be there for me when I face the unspeakable, when I face the shocking, when I face that event which upends the world as its organization made sense to me religious community, social connection. We can all benefit from social support, but it is far more helpful to have spiritually informed or religiously informed social support. It's an entirely different fabric of relationship, as you're well aware. Right? And finally, 
identifying meaning and purpose, rebuilding a map together that is foundationally spiritual. This is building the spiritual core. This is uniquely within the capacity of the chaplaincy. What I wouldn't do at Columbia to have a chaplaincy to address our problems. Right? Now, why is it so effective? This is a study that we published in Oxford University Press about two years ago, cerebral cortex. And I'm gonna walk you through this study because it's a metaphor, I think, for how a soldier might change in your presence or become aware of his or her capacity to live into life differently. We invited 18 through 25 year olds, this was um, done with my colleagues at Yale, some of whom you'll meet in the next couple of days, into the lab and we said, tell us three stories. Tell us a time when you were really stressed, tell us a time when you were just kind of relaxed, chill, and then tell us a time where you felt a deep and profound connection to God, your higher power, the universe, whatever words are yours. And we were expecting, of course, to hear about the greatest challenge they'd ever faced in stress when I, I tackled Kilimanjaro or I took on a feat I didn't know I could master. But in fact, the stress story sounded like this. I have got to get that promotion. If I don't get that promotion, I, I have got to get that date. If I don't get that date, I've got to, got to, got to. And the stress was formed by a need to control that which can't be controlled. It was a stress of having. A st it was really a, a golden calf stress. I've got to have it, I've got to have it, I've got to have it. And if I gave it to them, they'd got to have this. Right? That was a state of perception. I've got to have it. I've got to have the promotion. I've got to have that date. I've got to have it. That ran a part of the brain that is actually the addiction circuit. It's the same part of the brain that runs with addiction to alcohol and drugs, to food, and as you'll see with one of my colleagues, behavioral disorders, when Mark Potenza comes, the I gotta have it circuit. The stress circuit is the habit trail, the chase. You can take that same young person and say, I would like to invite you now, same person, same brain, to put your hand on the gear, and I'd like you to tell me about that time where you felt a deep and profound connection to God. Goodbye, stress circuit, insulin striatum. And instead, the very same person says, I'm walking down the street, I'm thinking I've gotta have that promotion, I've gotta have that promotion, it starts the same. But then I see the light in the trees, and I know that God has a plan and a purpose for me. And then I know that I will be a healer in whatever way God has intended for me. The much more sacred, bigger view. Goodbye, tiny purview, insulin striatum, and instead, the red brain comes online. The parietal, which sees our constant being both as individuals and in union. You have your story, I have mine, but we share a common being of life, the parietal. The bottom up versus the top down form of attention, the ventral versus dorsal. Suddenly, I see the light in the leaves. My attention is drawn to bottom up perception, right? I can be surprised, I can be guided, and a deep third point, sense of embrace and love. It's the same system that we experience with bonding. Love, unity, and guidance. Same brain, hand on the gear, it's our choice how we use it. And that is what you teach every day as the chaplain. When you are with someone in a state of stress and you help them make the choice to invoke to induce a spiritually grounded way of being and seeing. You are teaching that soldier, that leader, to put their hand on the gear shift and shift over to another way of being and perceiving. Right. That process is the process through which depression, stress, chasing, devastation, lack of control, ego death, becomes the doorway to illumination. This process where you teach me to change by choice my connection to God, the higher power, to actively engage is the process through which suffering becomes the doorway to a deepening of inner life. Trauma becomes the doorway to a deepening of inner life, an enhanced connection. And that is why in tertiary prevention, if you will, my life can be actually much more than before. And there is data that shows that survivors of assault, if they deepen their spiritual life, do better than people who have never faced trauma or assault, but have let their spiritual life go.
That is the work you do in, if you will, formation, tertiary prevention, renewal. Life is bigger than it was before. If we work that way here and now, in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years, it is there. The next time I face suffering and loss, in fact, the next time that someone else in my presence face suffering and loss, I have that way of being. I have this to bring to it, right? Now, I am not claiming biological reductionism. This is merely the docking station, the seat of perception, the connection to God, the higher power. You have taught me to use my wiring to be able to choose to connect with God, the higher power. Now, let me give you an example. Remember the red brains. We invited those same people. There was a cohort of people who had uh, recurrent major depression and matched controls to come, this time not get in the MRI, but to put on an EEG cap, which measure, whereas the MRI is a structural look at the brain, the EEG measures the energy that comes off my brain. It's a functional. How am I using my brain? What's coming out of my brain? And what we found was that those people who recovered through depression, through a deepening of spiritual life, those people who recovered from depression this way, gave off a very specific wavelength. It was high amplitude alpha. High amplitude alpha is the very same wavelength given off in recovery from depression, not through spiritual life, but through SSRIs, through Prozac. You can jumpstart my alpha. But then when we take away the SSRIs and there's no more drugs, I go right back. Leading us to wonder if part of what SSRIs do is jumpstart a process which organically, think of the inverted U shape, growth goes hand in hand with suffering. Organically, and ever more so with the support of a chaplain, is an opportunity for spiritual deepening. If I recover from depression through a deepening of spiritual life, my brain gives off the same wavelength as if you jump-started me with Prozac, but it lasts. And what is alpha? Well, this, I think, is very interesting. Posterior alpha is being given off. Remember, these are the red brain cohort. is being given off right where very often the head is covered in many traditions, right? Is posterior alpha. Alpha goes by another name in another field. It's, it's Schumann's resonance. Schumann's resonance is the wavelength of nature. From the Earth's crust up one mile, 7.83 hertz, which means the spiritually engaged brain vibrates with the wavelength of all life, of creation. Suffering is the gateway to that way of being. No one can take your place. In recap, pathology is a doorway to build capacity, build resilience. Suicide prevention is multi-phase at every single phase. It can be reversed through a deepening and strengthening of the spiritual core. And trauma is an opportunity for renewal, recovery and renewal. And in fact, that's how we're built but we certainly benefit from spiritual guidance on the road, the path of formation. What might be a model? I've worked with great joy side by side. Many discussions we've had in one model is a partnership, a partnership between the chaplaincy and mental health because no one's on each other's toes. Everyone is needed. Everyone is needed, it's all hands on deck, and the spiritual renewal. Is of ultimate value. Thank you. Okay. Shall we do some Q&A? I'll start and ask a question. Can you describe to us, part of what I think happens in the Army is with behavioral health, kind of the psychological perspective and kind of interpretation of spirituality, there seems to be kind of a confusing, confusion between what clergy do and what a behavioral health uh, practitioner does. 
and I think in some of our discussion, you've described how those are separate. So could you kind of just, for us, help us understand that distinction? Thank you, Chaplain McGraw. If you look at twin studies that identify the heritable contribution of personality and what psychologists, I'm a clinical psychologist, often call um, the work of the ego, um, not egotistical, but the management of ourselves, versus this deep spiritual capacity. Right? They are, in fact, distinct band bandwidths. Spirituality is not the same thing as personality. And in fact, if um, this was very well established in the first five years of, of this work. Um, the big five, which is basically the personality construct most commonly used by clinical scientists, is completely independent from the spiritual core. It is completely independent from the deep seat of spiritual and emotional awareness. Now, there is one of the five dimensions that overlaps somewhat, and that is openness to experience. To the extent that I am present and can perceive, I am positioned to better engage my spiritual core. But the spiritual core is a completely independent bandwidth of human formation. It has a different etiology development. It has a different heritable base. It, has, um, it goes hand in hand, of course, with the development of all other lines of human flourishing, but it, it is independent. Now, one of the most common confusions I see in the field these days is that very good um, sort of cognitive behavioral work, very helpful work around calming, on being present, on harvesting my attention, which is mindfulness work, is oftentimes sort of confused with spiritual work. Mindfulness is a way of being more present. It's very helpful for many people to be more present and har harness their attention. But it is not spiritual work. And in terms of the neurophysiology, it is, it is a different um, pathway. And we'll go into that in my next talk some more. Uh, mindfulness gets us to the front door by being present. But to walk through the door and walk on into spiritual awareness, what involves a deep connection as we've looked through these epidemiological studies of my sense of connection to God, my awareness. I turn to God for guidance. When I have a question, I ask, what really does God want me to do? Perceiving the presence of God in and through all life, that is not mindfulness. That is spiritual perception, spiritual awareness. Mindfulness can get me to the door where I start to notice things and then, with your help, may further develop spiritual awareness. Told another way around, we have worked with people to help them develop spiritual awareness. And when that happens, we find that it pulls along with it greater mindfulness, greater emotional regulation. The sort of more cognitive behavioral perceptual mechanisms come along with it. But the opposite is not the case, necessarily. Yeah. Okay. One more bit of science. I'm sorry if it's too, one more study. Um, we looked at the additive effect of mindfulness and religious observance. And there is an additive effect. If I'm all disorganized, mindfulness can get me present. But then the religious observance has another added effect. They are not overlapping. And to function as best I can, I absolutely need, whether it's whatever faith tradition it may be, religious observance or spiritual practice. Good morning, ma'am. I, uh, I heard a couple of things that gave me a little bit of concern, and I just want to make sure that I'm not misunderstanding. And if I am, hopefully you'll be able to clarify. Uh, you used the word capacity and the word innate. And when you were talking about the uh, inheritance factor of the capacity for spirituality, isn't the converse of that that some people are born without it? Thank you for the point of clar Thank you for the point of clarification. Everyone is born with it. So just as some people are gifted musicians and maybe have a little bit more of a tune, but we all can hear and sing music. We're all born with some basic sense of music. We're all born with some basic sense of language. That's probably the best analogy, language. But some of us are particularly mellifluous speakers and others, you know, I have someone in my house, but he still speaks. <laughs> so, so the idea is that um, this is all of ours, but like any trait, 
you are on to, there's a piece of this that's worth, with, worth clarifying. We all are born with an innate capacity, every one of us, for spiritual life. It comes in on different channels. Some of us perhaps are more intuitive. Some people are more people of the law. Some people are more people of community. So our overall constitution is how that capacity will be developed, but it is absolutely in every one of us. And what's so interesting, if I may, sorry, uh, is that, remember the brain where I have a choice of where to put my mind, right? The same neural correlates are found across faith traditions and between people who are religious and people who are spiritual but not religious. It's the same neural mechanism. So if I'm someone who says, sitting in the pews of my childhood church, I knew God is with me. Sitting by my parents' side in the synagogue, I feel God's presence. I'm running the same seat of perception, the docking station, as the person who says, walking through the woods, I know that all life is connected. Thank you for clarification, because I really feared the old Calvinist, Arminius arguments taking place during our breaks. So the next question was related to depression can be prevented or uh, minimized through spirituality, okay? My concern when I hear that is if you, it, when I hear that it triggers an alarm that if you just believed more or practiced more, you wouldn't have this problem. And there's a lot of folks that'll sell that and in my opinion, which is not a PhD opinion by any stretch, is that's pretty dangerous to, to say to somebody who's hurting and pretty dangerous to tell somebody who's under care, if you, if, if you were just a better Christian, you wouldn't need that medication. So okay. I, I wanted to give you a chance to speak to that a little bit. Thank you. I have two thoughts. Um, the first is um, the science is in your hands, right? And whether, you know, if you know that a deep, in my time of suffering, there is an opportunity to deepen my connection to God in my time of suffering. There's an opportunity to strengthen my spiritual core. That is knowledge in your hands. Whether you then choose to pray by my side or ask if I feel God's presence or wait to see, you know, whatever you do with that um, is in your hands as the practitioner, as the provider. So the science says there's an opportunity how that is translated and said and held and put into motion is your choice. And that example you gave would be someone's choice. That wouldn't necessarily be my choice of how to take the science forward, but that, that's a choice point in the provider, the chaplain's rollout. Another piece is that the fact that over, um, the science says something about our human condition. The science says something about lived spirituality. The science doesn't say anything about when and how God shows up, right? So that's, you know, that's beyond that. I can walk the science up to the edge of human capacity for transformation, but I don't, I don't push a button, obviously, and, and know how and when um, the higher power works, right? So that, that's another issue. It's a spiritual question, not a psychological one. Right? And then the third point that I think is, is relevant is that we looked at um, a large number of young people and what we found, let me back up. When I was on the road with the spiritual child, college counselors would grab me and they would say things like, you know, two thirds of my caseload is not clinical depression. It's existential developmental depression as you describe. It's a coming of age, the hunger of spirituality booting up, the hunger for illumination and connection to God. And what I'm finding in 18 through 25 year olds is that what looks like depression two thirds of the time is actually spiritual formation in need of support. But there's also the other one third, right? There are people for whom there's a little piece in the physiological pathway that's broken. And, I, and that if that's the case for me, I may want the opportunity for deepening in spiritual formation, and there are biologically based depressions. I mean, this doesn't say there aren't, but what the data seemed to say when we looked at the point raised by these college counselors, we, I, I listened to them, I went out, I looked at a large number of young people, about two thirds of depressions for young people are developmental depressions. They are existential spiritual formation. The surge as it boots up 
can have moments of great connection and illumination and closeness to God, it can also at times feel like a half empty glass of spirituality, two thirds. But one third, there can be other things too, right? So thank you for that point of clarification. Morning, Lisa, how are you? Hi. So um, I, I wanna kind of follow up on what you were just talking about a little bit, because I, I think that the, the, the issue for us is probably praxis even more than it is, I think the science is very helpful. But moving into the practice, I wanna ask a technical question that might help maybe take what you just said a step further that might be really helpful. Um, so I, I use Erickson a lot in terms of development, moving from the, the uh, role confusion into identity versus um, intimacy versus uh, identity kind of questions, the, the, that transition into adulthood, if you will. Um, what are some of the specific kinds of things that you might have seen in the science uh, kind of changes that happen. Erickson's very specific about some of those things. I wonder there, what are the things that you've seen that Erickson affirms that we might be able to grab onto to use in our work with, with these young people? And what are the, some of the things that Erickson, because Erickson's old and Erickson's a white guy and all of that, it may be some things that is not helpful. So I don't know if you could talk about it. Is that too technical? No, I'm, I'm happy to discuss it. Can you? I, I'm, thank you, and I'm happy to discuss it. Could you say a bit more about what you're already doing, and I can try to join with that, sort of in, in the progression, what you emphasize from Erickson a little more? You know? Okay, so what I'm thinking about here is, is some of what you just mentioned, the, the existential crisis of moving into adulthood, of, of what it me means to be a man or a woman, and some of the questions that that comes along with, I'm wondering if there's some specific things that have come out in the science that would be maybe not universal, but certainly common themes across humanity that we could that we could look at and using in our praxis as as pastoral care providers. Got it. Thank you. I'm so glad you asked. There's a wonderful study that was published about five years ago, in which emerging adults. Um, emerging adulthood, as you probably know, is the literature's response in the past 10 years to the idea that adolescents keep coming home and moving home. <laughs> and the idea is that emerging adulthood runs through about age 26, right? Beyond often, right? <laughs> right, basically the, the 20s. And then adolescence pushes up against it. Adolescence is, you know. So in this portrait, um, there's a wonderful study done in which late adolescents and emerging adults were looked at from 11 different countries, um, all of which had different faith traditions, different cultures. And this was done by the late Benson. Um, he ran the Search Institute in Minnesota. It was a beautiful study. And he looked in Ukraine, he looked in Thailand, he looked all over the place. And they identified common emergent with this surge, with the spiritual awakening of adolescence, common identifiable, exactly as you're saying, um, emergent hungers and commitments in adolescence, a hunger for truth, yeah. a call to service. Interesting enough, in both theistic and non-theistic countries, very interesting, was an emerging theism. Right. Um, I will send that, Chaplain McGraw. I will send that to the team if you all want to see it. Um, and I, I think it's actually, it's referenced in The Spiritual Child. It's, it's Benson, his first author, and it was published in um, the Journal of Positive Psychology. Yeah. Um, it's a very important point because if there is a one-third heritable contribution, then there are universal phenotypes, cross-culturally, cross-religiously that unfold just as all other lines of development unfold with the decade of my life. And in 18 through 25 year olds, they identified about nine different dimensions that came up all over the world. Is that helpful? Great, good. Good morning, ma'am. Chaplain Dave Schaffner. In the book, and then again this morning, you mentioned that there's about a 20 year I think you said 20 year growing scientific surety about the effect of spirituality and growth in folks. But you also mentioned that that hasn't made it into the, much into the public sphere and into the, I think in the book you said that there's kind of almost been a pushback on it. 
what is, what are the main factors that you see to that pushback? Because I think in the military we see the same thing, that using spirituality as a way to get at problems is oftentimes met with skepticism. Can you talk a little more about that? Thank you. Shall I tell a story? Um, it, the JAMA article with the red brains that showed there was a neurophysiological protective benefit of spirituality and religion against recurrent major depression took three years to get published, right? <laughs> Written, produced, you know, to write that up. And along the way, I found that the good scientists, I'd mentioned a bit of this, were absolutely curious we looked at the numbers to the T, were rigorous methodologists. There was no problem at all with the peer review process. And in fact, none of the science has ever faced a problem with peer review, pure science. The method is clear, it's very rigorous. But as a matter of taste and opinion, <laughs> it's profoundly evocative to many people. Right? So I have found that in, um, at Columbia, in my work with the public schools, in my work in Midtown with um, private sector organizations, leading with the science has helped open the door. The greatest impact I've seen um, in terms of you know, using the sickle to weed whack, I weed whack with science to clear the landscape. And I will have very skeptical people say to me, you know, the science, I'm a real left brain guy, someone will say. And the science, it speaks to the left side of my brain long enough that it quiets the nagging skeptic and I can open up other parts of myself. Um, so the struggle that I've seen when it comes to taste and opinion, um, the sometimes very ardent response I find, I mean there's people who stand up and scream, right? Is I take it to be an expression of their own inner struggle. That is their own personal spiritual struggle being screamed across the auditorium. Yeah. Um, the science is very straightforward. And the science says if we really want to help soldiers, if we really want to help 18 through 25 year olds, if we really want to help leaders make better decisions, if we want trauma to be not just something that you can sort of be numbed to, but rather grow through and deepen and strengthen, the science says that is a profoundly spiritual, it is a foundationally spiritual and religious process. That's simply what it says. And the pushback is, again, taste and opinion that I think, um, you know, it, it, ver it never comes from top scientists, I'll say that. Um, and I also find that very often it comes from people that felt like attacking anyway, you know. Um, so sort of the toughest folks that I've encountered um, didn't have one scientific claim or bone to pick. I'll give you another example. I wrote an article this big in the New York Times, and it was this big. It was so small, I didn't think anyone would see it. And it received reams and reams and reams of rage. <laughs> and not one of the criticisms was on scientific ground. And the article was, we know that there is an 80% decreased relative risk of addiction in teens who have a strong spiritual life. Can't we get ahead of this and help build their spirituality before they face addiction? And all sorts of New York Times readers from around the country, you know, Dr. Miller, you don't understand us. You know, like, there was a lot of Dr. Miller, you don't know addiction. Dr. Miller, you know, that was simply what the article published in the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry said. But then I got to my office, and we know that young people can find us, and there were dozens of emails from 18 through 25 year olds. Dr. Miller, this is me. I was searching for more, I felt empty, I felt darkness, I, want, I was searching for more and I took the tricky back door and I started using and then I got addicted. Thank you so much for this article, I finally felt like someone understood. The people who need it, the people who really need us, find us and we find them. And the science helps put that openness into the center space of government funded places and spaces. Yeah. Now, at my class at Columbia, we talk about spirituality a lot, and we have people from California and Maine and New York and Europe and Africa and Asia, they're from all over the world. And what we've discovered 
is that if we're going to have a discussion that puts spiritual and religious life into the center, everyone is free to speak in the first person. So one person will say, you know, I love God, I love God so much, I feel God with me everywhere I walk. My grandmother, she taught me to love God. And someone will say, oh, I understand that. My grandmother tattooed me and I am linked to her forever. And someone else will say, I understand that because energy cannot be destroyed, so of course your grandmother's souls persist. Everyone has their own language. And the deeper resonance of being spiritually multilingual is possible when everyone speaks authentically in the first person. What's a shame is to not have the class, right? So, and how did we get the class? I made the case 20 years ago that science says you can't have a mental health and not train people into spiritual life. Yeah. Start with science, follow the logic, and from the science comes the logic, the imperative, and from that comes the openness to experience. Other thoughts? Did I answer your question? Good. Maybe we're getting the, the high sign. Uh, really enjoying the discussion. So where I'm wondering with all the information that we have is what kind of examples we may have, say with industry, uh, some with industry who have embraced the science of spirituality and then applied it to their business and actually have seen cost savings and amounts of depression and the like. And I'm wondering how much of that might be shared with the DOD. Like, uh, so maybe who, uh, you've spoken to in the industry that have seen that, and maybe what leaders in the Department of Defense have listened to that and are open to the idea that this actually could drive down uh, the national debt, which could be the, you know, the number one threat against America right now, and they would see it in that way. Thank you. Well, the most immediate and obvious point is that a spiritually grounded decision is a better decision. If you look at the choice and how we use our brain from the position of leadership, from the position of leadership, I can make two different types of decision. Same brain, two different uses. The more tunnel vision perception is one that costs me in the long run a great deal. The spiritually grounded decision is one that has more information it's one that takes into account the impact on my decision on others. And most of all, it's one that doesn't hold the situation as a zero sum game, but rather has a much more creative, much more innovative possibility. So if I wanted to make an important decision, I would first ground myself spiritually. And the decision will be a much more innovative, creative decision. Okay, dollars and cents. Well, I think we all know that there is no replacement, we'd all agree, for human suffering. The financial cost of human suffering is immense, right? I mean, whether we're talking about inpatient hospitalizations, whether we're talking about a job poorly done, whether we're talking about training people who then quit, right, attrition, whether we're talking about relational violence or lack of relational ethics, um, you know, the spiritual core and the spiritually grounded decision making leads to better ethics, and we'll get into that in the next segment some more. The spiritual core leads to greater resilience, recovery. The rates of depression, the rates of addiction will be lowered. Hospital bills will be less. Work performance will be better. I mean, there's an, depression, as you know, is the leading cause of missing work. <laughs> it's not pulling my back or some you know, scuffle. Depression is the leading cause of missing work and of dropping out, and of poor performance, and of relational. Depression doesn't make me just sad, it makes me edgy and impossible to work with. Right? Depression is often has a lot of anger in it. It's very hard to manage someone, it's very hard to encourage someone who's depressed. So if I told you again that you take this pill and your workers will show up on time, they'll stick with the job for three years, not three weeks, you take this pill, your workers will be cordial and polite in a quick study. Great, right? So in a way that is inclusive and constitutional and welcoming, can we welcome people into engagement with their own spiritual core? Can we welcome people into a reliance on their deeper inner wisdom, their connection with God, Allah, Hashem, the universe, whatever word is theirs, 
but welcome them into their sense of ultimate connection. There, this is a trend, as you seem to suggest. It was an article in the New York Times the last few days of August that um, private sector businesses are now bringing in people to help support spiritual life in you know, Silicon Valley, in Midtown Banks. Um, I've been invited, I've gone to JP Morgan and done this work, and people loved it. You know, the idea that somehow spirituality isn't welcome is an outdated notion. The hunger is tremendous. We just need to start by starting and, and do this. You know, and there was enormous joy. The most senior people, some of the most senior people at J.P. Morgan were delighted to do a spiritual visualization. I, I'm glad to do it with you here. It was in the language of life. It wasn't my tradition or theirs. But not only were they delighted, they brought in their meal ticket, their most significant investors to have this experience because there's a clarity that there's a hunger, there's a pain, there's a lostness, and that this is an invitation to a spiritual reconnection. Um, there, the skeptic is no longer the bouncer at the door. <laughs> there's such hunger that the door is open. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Ah. Um, this work is new in its reach. It's not new in its fiber, but it's new in its reach, and I'm not aware of a lot of studies yet on this new movement, but there is um, more basic science showing that performance, persistence, um, the elements of success and productivity are greatly augmented by support of spirituality. There's basic science experiments um, that show that if you, for instance, put up the symbol of my faith tradition, I will persist at a task two and a half times longer. There's basic science that shows um, if I have a strong spiritual core, I've, and we'll get into this more, a strong spiritual core is associated with grit and persistence and optimism and the character strengths and virtues that support higher performance. In fact, it turns out that for 85% of the time, the character strengths and virtues, the, Marty Seligman was my mentor, and I love Marty Seligman deeply, but we disagree on this. Um, and the science says that the spiritual core is essential to the formation of the character strengths and virtues. The science says that in 18 through 25 year olds in a sample of 6,000 college students, the strength of my grit, optimism, forgiveness, commitment goes hand in hand with my daily spiritual awareness. And it is actually the minority of young people, 15%, who derive positive psychology values minus a spiritual core. Okay. Yeah. Just to follow up on that, so if we take this cost savings mm -hmm. by onboarding mm -hmm. employees more effectively, how, how would it look in our, like a basic training thing where we're trying to bring in trying to lower our attrition rate. Mm -hmm. um, what might that look like if okay. you engage the spiritual core? Great. The spiritual core is foundational to prevention and recovery. The spiritual core is also foundational to fitness and performance. Okay. So if at day one I come in in basic training and you help me strengthen my spiritual core, you will have in me someone who is more persistent has more grit, more determination. You will have in me someone who's a quicker study and who is more collegial and shows better teamwork with the other people with whom I just walked in the door. So there's, there's based on basic science, it's simply, um, the blueprint of science says that day one, you would wanna support my spiritual core. Again, it's innate, so it's there. It's a quarter inch under the surface and you have the opportunity to tell me you will be in difficult times. We're gonna give you now an opportunity to strengthen your greatest reserve that no one can ever take from you, your spiritual core. And your language and your customs are yours. We respect your denomination or choice not to have one, but the core is your birthright. And we're gonna give you support and practices to turn to your spiritual core in times of difficulty, to turn to your spiritual core to persist when you feel like giving up. When you're so angry and you want to punch someone, turn to your spiritual core. You know, you can, knowing what's to come ahead, you can prepare me 
and the sooner you do it, the better, because it's a foundational experience you're giving me. You can prepare me to turn to my spiritual core when, dot, 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 and you tell me what's going to come. When there is a loss, when the world falls apart, tell me, and I will know when the time comes. It's primary prevention to do that. Did we get there? Yeah. Say more? Yeah, I just, what would it look like? So if yeah. you're trying to engage young trainees mm -hmm. in explaining they have a spiritual core or something like that, mm -hmm. what might it look like? Good. So in, our, in the next talk, I talk about a program we've developed. We have the very same problem at Columbia University. We had a cluster of nine suicides. There were more. There were nine that were publicized. And there was no response. This, the wellness keeper would go and clean out their room. She was so overwhelmed. And we decided to get ahead of it by putting a program in every single dorm, optional, called Awakened Awareness, where we support the natural spiritual core in a way that's inclusive and universal. And sure enough, they may start then as students talking in the voice of their grandma, of their tradition, but we do something universal, so reigniting, rebooting the spiritual core. I will share with you an element of that because I think um, it's, it's a very helpful exercise in showing you can make a direct point of support. Um, so shall we do it? Okay. Um, if I came on board, I invite you into this practice, um, and you were to tell me that there will be times where you don't know what decision to make. There will be times of terrible confusion. There will be times where someone you love is lost, and you have in you the ultimate resource that no one can take away. You have with you at every moment, no matter how lonely you are, you have in you the spiritual core and I'm gonna give you now an exercise that shows me that as a young person. Should we do it? Okay, this exercise was taught to me by a psychologist who over 30 years worked with court-referred boys. When a judge in Salt Lake said, this kid's done, right? We've seen him three times. Um, they, these boys were everybody's least favorite people. They had been uh, abused, sexually abused, and they were now offenders. So no one wanted to work with them. And the judge, would say, you're going to Dr. Gary Weaver. And Gary Weaver loved these boys. Gary Weaver loved these boys. He would take these boys out into the desert, and he would do this practice. And I so respected how he worked that I required my doctoral students at Columbia to go out to Utah and train with him. They'd say, do we really have to? And I said, no, but if you want to work with me, you have to. <laughs> and they would go out with Dr. Weaver and the court referred boys into the desert, and this is a practice that he had developed to reignite, to reboot the spiritual core. As you know, may we do it? Okay, it's three minutes. I'm gonna invite you to close your eyes, and if you'd like, clear out your inner space. I invite you to set before you a table. This is your table. And to your table, you may invite anyone, living or deceased, who truly has your best interest in mind. And with them all sitting there, ask them if they love you. And now you may invite your higher self, the part of you that's much more than anything that you have or don't have, anything you've done or not done, your true, eternal, higher self. And ask you if you love you. And now finally, you may invite your higher power Whatever word you may use, as you know, 
your higher power. And ask your higher power if they love you. And now, with all of those people sitting there right now, what do they need to let you know? What do you need to know? What do they need to tell you? When you're ready, I invite you back. This is your council. They are always there for you. Who shows up may change, depending on where you are in your journey and what is your need. That is a Council that's conducted and held in the language of life. Those who truly have your best interest in mind, your higher self, your higher power. In my book, that's prayer. It's augmenting our awareness of our higher power, the sacredness in and through one another, relational spirituality, and who we really are. I've never, ever, ever seen anyone offended by that. I've never seen anyone upset by that. I've only seen people deeply reconnected through that. It was a gift of Dr. Gary Weaver. Dr. Gary Weaver, I want you to know, um, adopted 28 court-referred boys. And when I went to his funeral with my graduate students who insisted on paying their own way, graduate students, you know, can't buy a cup of coffee, one of the boys pulled me over and he said, you know, um, things in my house were really bad. I mean, there was abuse that was really bad. And he said, so I'd go out and I had a bike and I'd bike around and around and around and I'd always hear this one house where it was just people were laughing. It was full of laughter and music. And he said, I never dreamed someday I'd get to be adopted by Dr. Weaver. So that's a gift from Dr. Weaver. He woke up in those boys the deep spiritual core. It's all of ours. It's a quarter inch under the surface. He reawoke it. And whereas those boys were headed to prison, big prison, right? 85% of them never reoffended, right? He had essentially a rate of healing of 85%. Those boys were 30, three times in front of the judge about to lose their lives, right? as they knew, right, their freedom in their lives. So that is the gift of the chaplaincy. And as you ask Chaplain McGraw, if I come to you and we do this on day one, and you tell me that when I lose someone I love, or I can't go on, or I don't know what the right thing to do is, call my counsel, I'm ready to go. I know how to call my counsel. And the many other ways that you know already how to work as chaplain. That's an example. Thank you, uh, Dr. Miller. I just wanted to come up here to be able to take my mask off. 
so ask a good question. Uh, anyway, I, uh, I appreciate what we're talking about in, in regards to the spiritual core and what it means to us. Um, I want to go back uh, a little bit uh, from the beginning of, of the conversation. Um, and I know that there's, there's no thermometer uh, that we're able to check our, our temperatures to see who is uh, lonely or who's struggling with suicide, who's struggling with addiction. And I know I wish that we had one, but, but we, we don't. Um, uh, and in my tradition, you know, I would say maybe that was the point of the Holy Spirit to... Uh, who guides us in that. But my, my concern, and, and one of the things that I wanted to ask, and hopefully maybe we'll address it now or maybe later in the next three days or sometime, but is that um, a lot of times we feel the effects of, uh, of uh, suicide or uh, amongst our own families and, and even within our own ranks. And so how, how, do, we, how do we tie in somebody, uh, a chaplain who, who's grown up in the, in the chaplaincy, who, we, who we've known um, and never would have suggested that, that they would be able to take their life, or, 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 or clergy, uh, members of clergy's family uh, who struggle with depression to the point that, that they also you know, consider suicide. So how, how are we? How are we going to tie those two together? And what we've talked about b building a spiritual core to be able to be resilient when things come come against our life, and those people who've lived in it all their life um, finds no way out but suicide. Thank you. Wow. Um, thank you, and I I honor that we're on sacred ground. Um, I think there's a few things that science can say that are helpful. They don't answer the deep, deep hunger of the heart. They don't answer the deep, profound way in which you've shared that most meaningful, um, generous experience. But I, I, will, I will say these are things that science says that are helpful. Um, the first is that although we know that ideation is associated with an attempt a third of the time within two years, we have no idea when, what day, or how. So there's nothing we can do really, you know, and let's sort of hold on to someone's arm every moment of the day to know when and how someone may attempt to take their life. So there's a tendency in people who are survivors, those who loved the person who took their life, those who were around them, to feel guilty and responsible. That is the symptom of the depression and the suicide, right? We around them are not guilty and responsible. That felt sense of being guilty and responsible is the symptom, the interpersonal relational symptom of the depression and the suicide. And there is, every bit of data says on no given day can it be protected, predicted if today is the day someone's gonna try to take their life. And um, that's important. It's also the case that um, there are Passages and times in our life, we focused a lot on the 18 through 25 year old, we're gonna focus on them even more, but just as there is a period of spiritual struggle with late adolescence and emerging adulthood, so too at midlife, it, particularly for deeply spiritual people, is there a deep, hard existential struggle you know, our society has some cursory way of nodding at midlife crisis. It is a profound spiritual struggle and it is deeper and harder the more spiritually aware we are. Okay? And there are people who've never been depressed, who are deeply spiritual, clinically depressed, who are deeply spiritually committed, who at midlife have a profound struggle. And it's very much like the coming of age. Only this time, instead of what is my meaning, what is my purpose, what is the nature of life itself, is, is God real? That is, my life is now half, two thirds over. Have I used it truly as God intended it? Have I truly appreciated and given and loved? Have I, have I and oftentimes um, there's a lot of struggle in terms of worthiness um, and, the, and the fraying of the ego. And, and in fact, there's often, very interestingly enough, an outside life that mirrors the inside life that's non-causal, right? Suddenly I lose everything, right? From a spiritual or consciousness-based perspective. Um, 
so there's a 52 card pickup outside and inside. And it is even more um, deep and profound if I am sensitive and open. And if you were to think of the red brains, it is actually you know, the priests and the poets who are the more sensitive, who, for whom spiritual life is more augmenting of the cortex and who are more sensitive and prone to depression. Yeah. I remember, openness to experience is the only personality trait to be open and permeable that correlates with spiritual awareness. So these are gifts. They're not, um, they're not easy gifts always. They're gifts. Yeah. Did I answer? Yeah. Good morning, Dr. Miller. I also came here to unmask myself. Uh, my question is uh, really simple. So in your talk, you talked about uh, just briefly spiritual injury, but you didn't really uh, elaborate what it means. And uh, would you uh, define what it is and give us some examples of it? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, spiritual injury is, in many step, respects, a step beyond moral injury. Spiritual injury is when I feel unworthy before God. And we have interviewed people who say, I feel unworthy before God. That's a very chilly, cold place to be. And sometimes that feeling is so profound that I am cut off and unable to feel God's presence. I'm disconnected. So if you were to think of the Weaver Council visualization to invoke your higher power, to invoke, it, to try to rekindle the felt awareness in community. Um, spiritual injury, I could say from the view of the spiritual brain, has to do with the occluding of the perceptual network, to feel the sense of unity, love, and oneness, and to be aligned in perceiving life. That's, you know, from the view of the brain. But phenomenologically, existentially, it is, it is a feeling that I am unworthy and disconnected to God. When I've been on inpatient units, some of the greatest suffering I've seen is when people feel, I pray and I can't feel God. It's very, and in fact, in our work on the Columbia campus, where we've seen people who've survived assault come ask for spiritually integrated work, we find that they have already have a good therapist, and that's all fine, but they need something else as well. They need something more. And what they need, we've detected, is to address their, spirit, their felt sense of spiritual decline. They feel they're in a state of spiritual decline. There has been another time in their life where they felt more spiritually connected, where they prayed more, where they felt living in keeping with their faith tradition and their spiritual values. So a sense that I am in spiritual decline, I'm unworthy before God, and that I can't even connect to God. When I was on an inpatient unit, I had patients pull me into the kitchen, and then from the kitchen into the pots and pans room. You could not be more remote and hidden. And there they'd say, Dr. Miller, please, please will you pray with me? So they felt unable to pray alone in public space. They felt unable to pray in the presence of their healing therapist. They had a need. They had a need to pray. And there's nothing in the world that was going to take that place. And very often, there were people of a different faith tradition. One woman would bring out the rosary, and she'd pray as she's prayed all her life. And she'd pray for her, and she very generously prayed for me. And then I prayed the way I knew, and we went back and forth. That's what I had. And she wanted that. You know. You know. So um, spiritual injury was part of her recovery in the pots and pans room. And when I told, you know, this was I was junior at the time, I told the unit chief, they'd say, that, that's very wonderful you did that. That's just what the patient needed. But don't ever tell anybody. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> to get to your point. And um, I guess the bottom line is that we're there for the patient. And... Um, I can tell you nine times out of ten when I've shown up for the patient, I've been so grateful. That was the whole point of why I've done this work. I didn't want a fake career. The one time in ten I didn't show up for the patient haunts me. So my fear is not, you know, that the boogeyman is going to get angry at me for talking about spirituality. My fear is that I'll miss somebody. 
And very often I think the um, anger that others have is their own issue, but it's, it's, um, it's never actually crushing. There's not real substance in it. Um, but it is crushing to not show up for someone. That is, yeah. Yes. Sorry to interrupt, uh, but it's time to take a break. Okay. So 15 minutes. Uh, we have uh, Chow out there, uh, bathrooms around the corner. Um, and uh, we do have breakout rooms. So if for some reason, I think somebody called me uh, and said they didn't need to do a meeting at 10 or whatever, just let me know and we'll, we'll get you into a breakout room so that you can do that. <laughs> 